Okay, well, thanks for this venue. Um, Bono was supposed to be accompanying me uh, today, but he, I don't think he can show up, so I'll just have to do it in a way. So, um, okay, so this is a paper uh, with uh, Charles Engel and Steve Wu, and uh, it's uh, really very, very preliminary, and all, all the results are, are not really in yet. Um, so uh, comments are especially welcome. Uh, so what it is, it's uh, kind of another take on uh, the growing literature on the role of uh, the US dollar, and U.S. assets in financial markets, and particularly related to uh, what, what we call the convenience yield on, on uh, the U.S. treasuries. Um, so uh, it's widely acknowledged that, oh, by the way, we ha I have, uh, where is Stefan gone? I have an hour, is that right? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, widely acknowledged that the U.S. dollar plays a really big role in global financial markets. Now, one aspect of this, and we're going to focus on it, is the convenience yield. So the convenience yield we define as the excess expected return on uh, foreign government bonds relative to U.S. government bonds uh, adjusted for expected changes in the exchange rate. Now, this expected expected return is positive, or when we flip it the other way, the expected return is negative. So U.S. government bonds have a lower expected return than equivalent foreign government bonds. So um, this can't be explained by differential risk. Uh, these are, are more or less riskless assets. And um, the previous literature, uh, Charles and, and Steve and among other uh, papers, have shown that this uh, is, is actually a driver of the U.S. real exchange rate. Um, so what we do in this paper is construct an endogenous convenience yield um, that is driven by particular aspects of, uh, of, of constraints in financial markets, and we can sh show that it brings together a large number of facts in uh, U.S. Uh, about the U.S. dollar, U.S. financial assets, and the kind of uh, the the uh, the role of, of the U.S. in, in um, financial crisis and, and uh, the issue of global imbalances. Uh, so what we do in this paper is construct a model of, the endog of an endogenous convenience yield. And um, we show that this brings together quite a few themes in previous studies. Uh, First of all, we show that the convenience yield uh, acts as a driver of the exchange rate. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not exogenous itself, but uh, it does have a high uh, correlation with the exchange rate. Uh, the model is one in which uh, endogenously the U.S. is a net debtor, but it earns a positive income return on uh, its uh, balance of payments, uh, which is kind of a puzzle uh, that, that you know, people have, have wondered in the literature. Uh, the U.S. enjoys you know, what's what we call an, an exorbitant privilege. Uh, so in normal times, uh, it uh, pays a low rate of return on its uh, liabilities relative to the return on its assets. But during financial crisis, there is a large wealth transfer from uh, the, the U.S. to the rest of the world that is facilitated by a big real appreciation of the dollar. So this is like what's, what we call, what has been called the exorbitant duty of the U.S. Um, and uh, importantly, the model has what we what we see as a, a capital flow retrenchment uh, during crises. Uh, there is a big fall in both inflows and outflows. Uh, to, um, to, all, to all countries during a financial crisis. Uh, so let me just show you a few pictures uh, just to kind of motivate what we do. Uh, first of all, I think it's well recognized that uh, the U.S. has a big real appreciation during financial crisis. So uh, this is sometimes seen as a flight to safety or flight to quality. Uh, so we see that uh, the GFC had uh, this, this um, characteristic. We also see uh, combined with this and really facilitated by this is that the U.S. has a big wealth transfer to the rest of the world during a financial crisis. So U.S. NFA over GDP fell sharply uh, in the 2009 crisis. Um, now, this is seen as kind of the exorbitant duty of the U.S. Now, um, 
results from the Engel and Wu paper and, and uh, Jan Krishnamurti and, uh, Krishna and Lustig uh, show that uh, this real appreciation of the US is uh, highly correlated with the convenience yield, that is the excess return. So we can think of it like as a deviation from uh, uncovered interest rate parity. Uh, so there's a, a big spike in uh, the excess return on uh, non-US assets relative to US Treasury bills during, during a crisis. Uh, the second fact that uh, I want to, to flag, because we're going to talk about this in the model, is this retrenchment. There's a big fall in capital inflows uh, and capital outflows. So this is both the US, Germany, and the G10 average. So this is a very kind of distinct aspect of uh, the GFC uh, that we're, we're going to focus on, but it holds uh, for, for other financial crises uh, as well. Um, and the final thing, uh, just focus on the GFC, is that there's a fall in the US relative to world GDP and US relative to world consumption ratio. So the, you know, the exorbitant duty, the transfer of wealth is associated here, at least in the GFC, with a fall in real activity and real consumption in the US relative uh, to, to the rest of the world. So there are some kind of empirical facts that we want to um, basically uh, focus on for, for our, our modeling aspect. The, the insurance story is very well known and it's, it's very persuasive in the sense that you know, the US is seen as a global insurer of the kind of world financial market. Uh, the exorbitant privilege is it runs a you know, it has an excess return on its net foreign assets in normal times, and then the insurance payout is in crisis times by a US dollar appreciation. So, you know, the, the kind of narrative is that this crisis is associated with the flight to safety. But, you know, our view is this is kind of questionable. You know, if it's insurance, uh, why would you actually go and buy insurance when your house is burning down? I mean, why do you, you know, fly to safety when the dollar is appreciating and it's expected to lose money? Uh, it's expected to, to depreciate. Uh, also, this retrenchment kind of goes against the flight to safety. You know, I mean, there's a pullback in, in uh, both inflows and outflows. So the question is, why does the dollar appreciate? Um, now, this is also related to uh, the well-known um, majority paper on the kind of reserve currency paradox. If the U.S. net foreign asset, if the U.S. net wealth falls, uh, then U.S. absorption falls, then you would expect a, a real depreciation rather than an appreciation. Uh, so if we think that, you know, the real exchange rate is driven by, you know, non-traded goods demand or terms of trade effects or something like that. Um, so our version is uh, a different one. It's not related uh, to risk, and in, in fact, because as you'll see, uh, our model is just a uh, linear approximation, there's essentially no risk, Every, everything um, is, is certainty equivalent. Uh, our story is that treasury bonds are attractive, uh, not just for the monetary return, but there's some liquidity or convenience yield. So we, we hardwire this into the model, as I, I like explained to you. Uh, that gives an expected real excess return uh, to the rest of the world bonds. So this is, in, in real terms, uh, the convenience yield in our model, this eta tilde here, is the expected excess return on foreign government bonds relative to, to the US treasuries. So as we'll see, a global downturn leads to a big rise in this convenience yield, uh, rise in, in the convenience of US bonds and a spike in the convenience yield, that's associated with a real appreciation. That's an endogenous real appreciation that is, that is not uh, related to risk per se. Uh, and a lot, it, it, it's a real appreciation that's facilitated with, you know, without a direct flight to safety. It's not. In fact, we have exactly the opposite. We have the retrenchment in our model. There's a kind of flight you know, away. Uh, so, so that that is our kind of our alternative story. So here's what we do in the paper. It's uh, basically a plain vanilla New Keynesian DSGE model. 
uh, banks face uh, collateral constraints. This is kind of Gertler, Gertler Karate slash Kiyotaki type of framework. Uh, it's a symmetric two country model. One key assumption. Uh, that drives the whole thing. Without this assumption, we'd have nothing. Uh, the U.S. bond is assumed to be better collateral than foreign bonds. Uh, so the banks essentially have to meet a, a collateral or an incentive constraint, but the U.S. bond is uh, assumed to be easier to value. Uh, it's more liquid, uh, and so the collateral constraint on the U.S. treasuries is less than other treasuries. So this one assumption... Uh, can essentially facilitate all those um, empirical um, um, observations, I said. So what we find is, well, uh, there's a steady state where the U.S. has uh, a negative NFA, the U.S. is a debtor, but it has an expected positive income account and its uh, balance of payments. Now, that's, that's really kind of coming from our assumptions. It's not really uh, an endogenous pr uh, part of the model. But uh, what we're really focusing on was we take a uniform global shock. We take, say, uh, there is a financial crisis, which is essentially kind of like a fall in confidence of the global financial system, which is all countries. It's not just a US shock. Uh, so we find that uh, this leads to banks uh, having a tighter balance sheet uh, they run to the least constrained assets, which is U.S. bonds. Uh, this leads to an appreciation, a real appreciation. Uh, there's an endogenous wealth transfer to the rest of the world because of this real appreciation. Uh, now, there's no reserve currency paradox. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a fall in U.S. Uh, absorption, but uh, this is associated with the real exchange rate, and this is because we have this other feature of the model. The real exchange rate is not driven by the terms of trade, but it's driven by deviations from uh, the law of one price. You know, after all, this is a paper with Charles Engel in it, so we have local currency pricing. Um, and we have this retrenchment for both countries. Uh, and we have this an, uh, um, the, uh, uh, endogenous uh, deviation from uncovered interest rate parity. Um, okay. Uh, so first of all, I'm just going to show uh, some very quickly some empirical evidence. Um, and this is essentially to uh, motivate the idea that uh, the convenience yield in the model, the convenience yield will be mostly driven by this uh, global financial shock. So the convenience yield itself is endogenous, of course. Um, so I'll show some evidence uh, using high-frequency identification that the global financial shock ca causes uh, a real appreciation through movements in the convenience yield. Then I'll go through uh, the basic model, which is fairly standard, except for this one uh, assumption about collateral. Then we'll look at some quantitative uh, talk about the calibration and some impulse response functions. And as I said, uh, the, you know, we haven't really, uh, really finished this paper fully, uh, so we have, we have um, uh, uh, not all the results in yet. So, uh, so here's some, uh, just a, an empirical exercise. Uh, so we look at a, a panel regression uh, showing the convenience yield, how it affects exchange rates. So we look at the, the dollar against G9 currencies, um, and uh, the convenience yield here is instrumented using financial shocks. So there's this uh, new paper by Ottonello and Song uh, where they look at high-frequency identification, and the idea is they look at the changes in the market value of financial intermediaries in a 30-minute window around earnings announcements. Uh, so they have four instruments uh, using uh, daily data. Um, so we, go, we look from 2001 to 2014. Uh, so our regression specification looks like this. This is the change in uh, the U.S. exchange rate uh, so this is the nominal exchange rate against, uh, of course, it, I mean, it would be the same as a real exchange rate because it's daily data. Um, so uh, we look at that against the change in this convenience yield. So this convenience yield here is measured as the payoff of a synthetic U.S. bond. Uh, 
by uh, looking at the return on a foreign bond and hedging in the forward market compared to uh, the return on the U.S. Treasury. Uh, so this is what the results look like. We see that uh, a 1% increase in the convenience yield, where this is driven by these high-frequency shocks, would lead to a 9% dollar appreciation, uh, controlling for interest rate differentials and uh, this, this, these other error correction terms here. So, as we'll see, this is consistent with uh, the model mechanics. So we're going to kind of return to uh, the model and look at, uh, the, at this regression right at, right at the end in the simulated data. Um, so we have this two-country New Keynesian model. Um, so we have uh, the goods market is standard. We have just, we're thinking about the home uh, as the US, foreign as Eurozone. Uh, there is nominal price stickiness, and uh, we have local currency pricing, which is, as I mentioned, is an important part of the story. Uh, the banking sector is the Gertler Karate, uh, Gertler Kiyotaki, um, and uh, as is standard, we have this uh, incentive constraint coming from moral hazard, uh, and this is a constraint on asset holding. Uh, the asset markets, we have a home bond, foreign bond, home capital, foreign capital. And the key thing is that the home bond, or the US bond, is assumed to be uh, better, better collateral. Um, so here's what the basic model looks like. We have households on two sides of the market. Households deal with banks. I know, Larry, it's really not going to like this. Uh, so households make deposits with banks. <laughs> um, and the banks then engage in this uh, portfolio diversification. They hold capital, government bonds of the two countries, two countries' capital. Um, and then we have you know, capital-producing firms, so capital accumulation. Um, and, and we have uh, production firms. Uh, so uh, households are very standard. We have you know, uh, uh, CRA consumption. Uh, uh, see your, um, we have home and foreign goods. Households make deposits uh, with a bank, with their own banks. They receive profits. They receive a government transfer. They make an injection to these new banks, uh, the, the Gertler, Karate, Kiyotaki type banks. Um, firms are uh, standard. They uh, use labor and capital to produce output, a continuum of uh, domestic firms. Uh, now, firms uh, set two prices because uh, they set a price in home currency for home sales and foreign. Uh, then we have local currency pricing and we have sticky prices, Rodenberg price adjustment. Uh, we have capital producers, which are uh, kind of standard uh, adjustment costs of, of capital. Uh, OK, so the banks. Uh, so, is there a question? So, this is uh, the standard Gertler and Karate framework. There's uh, a fraction theta of, of households become banks, and then one mi fraction, one minus theta, uh, uh, end up being banks and, and consume. Uh, the banks borrow from their local uh, depositors, uh, combine this with net worth, and invest in home capital, foreign capital. Uh, where Q is the capital price in nominal terms, uh, home bonds and foreign bonds, and S is the exchange rate. Um, okay, uh, so these are banks' net worth dynamics. The net worth comes from the return on all their assets, uh, less the return they pay to depositors. Uh, they invest in both domestic and foreign assets, and that's, uh, that's fairly standard. Uh, okay, so the banks have this uh, value function uh, where the value is at, of the bank at the end of any period is the expected stochastic discount factor of their domestic holders um, uh, times the expected return on the banker's consumption if uh, she uh, dies and consumes net worth on the uh, expected return on next year's value function. Uh, so they maximize this value 
by investing in these four assets subject to the incentive constraint. So the incentive constraint is that uh, uh, the value of the bank has to exceed at least the weighted value of the assets. So the weighted value of the assets is the value they get from running away. So, um, so they have to have an incentive to, to uh, stay in business. Now, here's uh, the, the key assumption of the model. Uh, instead of just adding up the value of all the assets on their balance sheet, uh, we weight them. And so it's the particular weighting scheme we have. Uh, so here is our weighting scheme. So the banks can, absor can abscond with this weighted value where uh, this, actually, I should know the, the Greek term for this. Does anyone know this? This is the shock in our model. Anyway, I'm going to call this V. Uh, uh, v is a, is a uniform exogenous weight. Uh, then these other weights are chosen by us. Uh, so in particular, there is a collateral weight on home capital, collateral weight on foreign capital, collateral weight on home bonds, and collateral weight on foreign bonds. And these are kappas. OK, uh, so the lower the kappa parameters, the less the asset is assumed to be divertible, and the more it's pledgeable. And then our key assumption is that the home bond is the best collateral. That is, the US Treasury is better collateral than the foreign government bonds, better collateral than home capital or foreign capital. And the same thing for foreign banks. The US Treasury is better collateral for foreign banks than the foreign bond uh, is for, for foreign banks, although we don't necessarily uh, make these parameters the same. So we're going we're to uh, calibrate these parameters to match uh, a number of moments, particularly the, um, the, the, the average convenience yield on, on uh, US treasuries. Um, OK, so uh, a kind of uh, another kind of technical issue here to avoid uh, a global solution, uh, we're actually making this constraint uh, convex. So we say these kappas uh, are not constant, but they're a function of the bonds itself. Uh, so this is actually required to have a determinant portfolio solution uh, because we have a linear approximation. And uh, without that, we wouldn't have any, any determinant portfolio. So we basically used, uh, we adjust these, uh, these quadratic terms uh, to actually pin down uh, the, the US relative to uh, foreign portfolio. In particular, one of the moments we pin down is the foreign holding of US treasuries. Um, so, uh, but these, these numbers are, are very small. It just avoids an indeterminate solution. They don't really play any role in, in uh, the, you know, the qualitative results of the model. Uh, okay, so here is uh, what the first order conditions look like. So the home bank invests in these four assets. And because uh, the bank is subject to this incentive constraint, we have an excess return or a spread over deposit rates on all the assets. So this spread is uh, determined by the uniform constant on the constraint, the V term. It's determined by the kappa H's. Uh, or kappa Fs, you know, the, the, the asset-specific uh, collateral parameters. And of course, it's determined by the Lagrange multiplier, which is the, you know, how binding uh, the, the incentive constraint is. So you can see uh, why uh, this, this multiplier is going to play, play a role. Um, so if we combine the first order conditions for the home bond and foreign bond for the foreign bank, then we get this modified UIP condition, uh, which says the expected return uh, in the expected exchange rate adjusted return on the foreign government bond relative to the US Treasury is equal to this. And uh, because kappa HT is less than kappa FT, then that's you know, a structural feature of the model that, on average, this expected return uh, is going to be uh, is going to be uh, positive, but it's also going to be time varying. 
uh, because of this EDA, because of the, the incentive, the, the, the multiplier and the incentive constraint. Uh, so in a log linearized sense, we get this adjusted, uh, we get this UIP. So this looks like uh, a risk premium, but it's not a risk premium. It's more like, you know, uh, 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 moral hazard premium, or, uh, or kind of an or an enforcement uh, premium in 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 UIP, right? So so this is the definition of the convenience yield in in nominal terms. In in actual fact, in the model, we're going to just rewrite this in real terms uh, to get it in, in in the real exchange rate. But if we think about it, so so this we have this eta tilde convenience yield, which comes out of the um, the, the model, as we'll see. So Ceteris Paribus, a rise in the convenience yield leads to a dollar appreciation. Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, we can see that if eta tilde rises and policy rates are constant, then there has to be an expected depreciation. Uh, so, you know, that is facilitated in the model by an immediate appreciation. Um, so but the convenience yield itself is going to be driven by this multiplier and the balance sheet constraint. Okay, then uh, the other aspect about the model is uh, the real exchange rate. So if we had uh, producer currency pricing, so we had full uh, pass-through and uh, the law of one price held, this would be the real exchange rate. It would be driven by the terms of trade. Uh, with and if we, as long as we have home bias and consumption, then the real exchange rate uh, would be one for one, moving with the terms of trade. But in our model, actually, we have this uh, deviation from the law of one price. Uh, so that's going to be, you know, a big aspect of the real exchange rate, as we'll say. Uh, then uh, policy is just determined by uh, Taylor rule with interest rate smoothing. Uh, then fiscal policy uh, is uh, uh, affected by these exogenous issue of government bonds in both countries. So, so we do actually need government bonds because the banks, you know, have to hold these bonds for stuff to matter. Um, so, but uh, we're just going to assume the, these are kind of exogenously supplied. Uh, and uh, then the banks, uh, th then the, the fiscal authority makes... Uh, uh, subsidies to um, to eliminate monopoly distortions. Uh, so uh, market clearing is standard. Uh, then uh, the home balance of payments is, is standard. We we uh, I can just uh, go. Uh, this is like putting you know ba banks, uh, government, fiscal authorities together. Uh, uh, Okay, so the calibration, we have quarterly frequency. Now we solve this just by log linearizing. So, you know, as I said, risk isn't, uh, isn't uh, an issue here. But as I said, we have this, this quadratic cost because we need to pin down the portfolios. Uh, so the kind of the household and firm side of the model is very standard. Uh, so for the calibration for uh, the, the bank side, we have to be a bit careful. So we have uh, a total government debt to GDP we set at uh, 83% just to, uh, to, to match uh, US numbers. I can't remember from which, which year that is. I guess this is around the GFC. Uh, that, that, is, that doesn't really play a big role in the model. The bank survival rate uh, we match a leverage of three, so bank survival rate is you know 95 percent uh, per quarter. Um, okay, so we uh, we choose these kappa H, kappa H star, kappa F, and kappa F star to match a convenience yield of one percent uh, to make the U.S. a net foreign debtor and have, but at the same time, have a positive income account in the balance of payments, and to have foreign holding of US treasuries of 45%. Uh, so we take this from Frank Warnock, who told us this was the right number. Uh, so 45% of treasuries in the baseline case are, are held by, by the, the rest of the world. Uh, we match, we set the kappas on the capital uh, for the home and foreign country so that uh, we want both a home bias in equity and we construct a home bias by making uh, the, 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 
the, the kappa uh, kf equal uh, to, uh, okay, sorry, yeah, I got this backwards. Uh, the kappa kh star, which is the pledgeability that the home country has for its holding of foreign capital, we set that higher than the kappa kh, which is the pledgeability on domestic capital. And that uh, those uh, two numbers allow us to match an equity premium of 6% and then a home bias in equity of 70% where we're seeing this, this capital as, as, as equity. Okay, uh, so this leads to uh, a negative NFA of, over GDP, a positive uh, convenience yield, but a net income from abroad uh, which is positive, 0.13% of GDP in, uh, in the, the current account. Uh, so the, the, because it's an asymmetric calibration, uh, there's certain asymmetries. The U.S. has a slightly higher consumption in steady state, has a slightly lower work effort in steady state, and a slightly lower GDP because of that in steady state. Uh, and the leverage is slightly higher for the home bank than the foreign bank. Um, so, okay. Uh, so let's look at uh, some, some experiments. Um, so we have a 1% uniform shock to the financial constraint or this, uh, this uh, incentive constraint, and it hits all banks. So this is not a, you know, a specific US shock, it's just a global shock. So it's a tightening of all assets on the incentive constraint, and let's assume this is AR1 with a persistence of 0.98. Uh, so this has, it's a symmetric shock, but it has asymmetric f effects. It's hard to see in this, uh, but it does turn out that the shadow uh, uh, constraint the shadow uh, value of uh, on the domestic uh, the u s constraint uh, rises more uh, than that on the the foreign constraint um, and i 'll explain why that is as we go through the other IRS so the u s banks are hit uh, more than than the foreign banks um, so what is going on here well First of all, let's look at the real exchange rate. So uh, this is the convenience yield in real terms where it's equal to the real interest rate differential um, less uh, plus the expected change in the real exchange rate. Uh, so we see the real exchange rate and the nominal exchange rate appreciate strongly uh, and then are expected to depreciate uh, following that. So the convenience yield rises, and actually, uh, unfortunately, we have the negative of the convenience yield here. So it looks, it looks like it's falling, but this is rising. So it's, it's essentially the negative of this. So we have you know, a big increase in the expected return on uh, the expected real return on foreign, on foreign bonds relative to domestic bonds. Uh, so we can see most of the convenience yield is driven by uh, the real appreciation. There's a very small increase in the U.S. real interest rate. In fact, the, U the U.S. policy uh, rate or the nominal interest rate here actually falls relative to the, the foreign uh, nominal interest rate, but this is the real interest rate. But we have this very strong U.S. dollar appreciation, even though this is you know, a completely uniform uh, global shock. And the intuition is, you know, I think pr fairly clear. Uh, this is the, um, you know, this uh, relative uh, spread, which is coming from the um, uh, the uh, home bank's first order condition. We see that, you know, in the steady state, the convenience yield. Uh, this is, you know, I'm sorry, I'm switching signs here. This this is the, the negative of the convenience yield. So in the steady state, this is negative uh, because of the, assume, the assumption on the CAFAs. But then when we have the financial shock, ETA rises, and so this has to get more negative. Uh, policy rates are relatively stable, so the exchange rate must appreciate to facilitate this higher convenience yield. Uh, now, the home banks are hit 
more by this real appreciation. The real appreciation increases uh, the balance sheet uh, by valuation effects of the foreign banks. Uh, it, it, it reduces uh, home banks. Um, so in addition, we have this real effect. Uh, so I haven't talked about you know, the investment side of the model, but if we think you know, not of the spread of home bonds over foreign bonds, but the spread of capital over home bonds, then there's a differential effect on the US relative to uh, the rest of the world. So we can see uh, the differential of the home investment spread uh, rises more than the foreign investment spread because of this low kappa H relative to kappa KH when compared in uh, when we compare the U.S. Uh, situation to the foreign situation. So the intuition that, you know, there's this greater home or U.S. capital spread over the home bond. So the home banks are actually hit more. So investment falls more because the, the spread, the expected return on uh, U.S. equity has to rise more than the expected return uh, on foreign equity, and this equity here is real physical capital, so uh, this, this causes uh, a, a, a greater fall in domestic or U.S. investment relative to home investment, and that you know, is coincident with the tighter constraint on home bonds or U.S. bonds relative, uh, sorry, the tighter constraint on the, the, the home banks relative to, to foreign banks. Uh, so, so we have you know, this uniform shock, a differential effect, which is causing uh, real appreciation. This real appreciation uh, is having uh, a tighter uh, effect on home banks relative to foreign banks. And it, it combined with the assumed kind of differential pledgeability, uh, we have a greater real effect. OK, so the, what about this kind of exorbitant duty uh, in, uh, situation. Well, we said that you know, part of the narrative about uh, the US in the global financial system is that in bad times, uh, US net wealth falls uh, relative to the rest of the world, and that's the insurance. Well, here we don't have insurance, but we do get this exorbitant duty. We get a fall in US NFA because of this big real appreciation. Uh, for the U.S. consumption relative to foreign consumption falls. Uh, but we get this by a real appreciation of the U.S. dollar uh, without any movement in the terms of trade. In fact, the terms of trade slightly uh, depreciate uh, because of the fall in U.S. Uh, demand, U.S. investment with, uh, uh, with home bias in... in um, in consumption and home bias in, in investment. Uh, so the terms of trade have a slight depreciation, but the terms of trade and the real exchange rate are, are dramatically uh, separated because of uh, the deviation from the law of one price. So we get this wealth transfer to the rest of the world, a rise in the terms of trade, but a real appreciation. Uh, so this you know, is an answer to this reserve currency paradox, which is basically saying that, you know, the in the data, clearly in the data, the real exchange rate and the terms of trade are very separate objects. And uh, so we want to emphasize the. Um, OK, so what about then capital flows? We said, you know, we have this retrenchment issue. So the kind of surprising thing about this is that we have this big retrenchment uh, that is an endogenous response to this global financial shock. So the home bank has a big increase in its holding of home bonds and a big decrease in its holding of foreign bonds. Uh, the holdings of the foreign bond, uh, of the foreign bank is, uh, you know, exactly a mirror image. Uh, so um, the uh, foreign... Uh, yeah, so, so this is holding of home bond, holding of foreign bond. I think th this is a... Uh, 
Yeah, so the home, sorry, this is the home bond, the U.S. Treasury, this is the foreign bond. And so we see that home has a drop in its holding of foreign bonds and an in, uh, foreign has an increase in its holding of foreign bonds. So, so there's basically a big retraction or retrenchment. So, so what is the logic for that? Well, I mean, basically, there is a desired bond, which is a low collateral bond, which is the U.S. Treasury. Uh, but there's also a big real appreciation, and the real appreciation kind of, you know, uh, automatically increases the share of the U.S. bond held by foreign banks. Uh, so that kind of satisfies. They both want to hold the, the low collateral uh, uh, treasury, uh, but the... You, the, um, uh, the, the foreign bank uh, gets kind of an endogenous increase in its share by the real appreciation. Um, so in equilibrium then, because they, they both want to hold it, in equilibrium, the home holds more bond and the less than the foreign bond. So the key thing is we get this real appreciation despite retrenchment. So we don't actually have a flight to assets. So in equilibrium, the asset holding is consistent with this big retrenchment, uh, even though the U.S. is the Treasury is the best asset, but the real appreciation kind of satisfies the demand for, for Treasuries by, by the foreign bank. So there's no kind of flight to quality here. There is uh, a, a retrenchment. Um, so, you know, we don't, we, uh, so the insurance mechanism is satisfied with it without, you know, without this, this big uh, in, uh, uh, jump in, into treasuries. Okay, uh, so that is uh, uh, kind of uh, running out of time here. Is that, so that's basically the, the, the main set of results we have so far. Uh, we can look at a negative TFP shock as well, uh, and this has similar effects uh, because a negative uh, TFP shock is also uh, tightening the constraint on all banks. So this is a global TFP shock. Uh, we have the same real appreciation, uh, the same uh, increase in the convenience yield, uh, but this is much smaller. So the direct financial shock plays, uh, you know, quantitatively a much bigger role. Um, what about monetary shocks? So let's say we have a global tightening of uh, monetary policy, like a, a, an increase in real interest rates. So like in a, sorry, an increase in policy interest rates. So in a standard model, you would think this would have, you know, very little effect on the exchange rate. It's just a, you know, uh, a uniform tightening of uh, policy rates. Uh, in this model, a global or symmetric monetary tightening causes a big real exchange rate appreciation and an increase in the convenience yield in exactly the same way, a big deviation from uh, UIP. Uh, so the convenience yield demand kind of drives the, this real exchange rate appreciation, despite that this is, uh, uh, you know, a, a uniform monetary shock. Um, okay, so I'm pretty much uh, done here. Um, uh, we, we look at QT as well, so uh, that's a, this is just a QT experiment where the home central bank sells part of its equity and buys bonds. Uh, so this is, we don't, you know, we don't have bank reserves in this model, but, but QT has similar effects. Um, so uh, the last thing is uh, the importance of local currency pricing. If we had a PCP or producer currency pricing version we get hardly any movement in uh, the real exchange rate. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, local currency pricing is re really an important part of the, the whole story. Uh, then uh, the, the final thing is we just rerun these uh, regressions with simulated data. Uh, these are the regressions I, I showed um, before. Th these are, instead of the daily data, these are quarterly, uh, or, I'm sorry, monthly data. We use the same, and we, we get, you know, similar numbers. Uh, uh, this, so this is the model driven by all shocks, uh, by financial shocks, TFP shocks, and monetary shocks. But, you know, we get this kind of negative relationship between changes in convenience yield and, uh, and uh, the changes in, in the nominal exchange rate. Okay.
So I always worry about exchange rate disconnect, but you could probably get that too. Because uh, yeah, yeah, we have. Um, uh, well, these are these are some numbers. These are the move, the numbers from the Skoki Mukin paper. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, we we uh, uh, we have a disconnect. We get a pharma negative number. Uh, we're not matching everything here, but uh, we get kind of uh, uh, the correlation between the real exchange rate and, and the net exports is is pretty small, so we get this amount of, of disconnect. But, uh, okay, so conclusion, we have this model of the endogenous convenience yield. Uh, it's linked to this banking friction. The key thing, you know, the only real assumption in the model, uh, sparks from kind of standard uh, model features, is this U.S. bond is a better collateral. Uh, we don't have any asymmetry in shocks. We just have this structural asymmetry, and it, it matches, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, stylized facts about uh, the U.S. Uh, financial market.